I would offer a coin for your thoughts to the warm voice behind her, but I fear the price may be too high. Lady Gina Proudmore turned from the view of the city below as her old friend joined her on the parapet. Despite his size and heavy armor, he had somehow made it up the tight and winding stair of Proudmore's keep's tallest tower without making a sound. Thrall leaned on the old stone and looked out across the Borales, took a deep breath of the cool air. I can see why you treasure this spot. Jaina nodded. The tower offered her the solitude and privacy to think, while the view of Borales offered perspective, a reminder of where she was and who she was. And right now, as the sea mist cleared, Borales shone like a sapphire in the dawn. A thousand roofs, a hundred spires all glowing with the promise of a new day. From the tower, Gina could fully glimpse her domain, from the snowy mountains of the great harbor in which sat the mighty Kultiran fleet, with a dozen of its fastest ships ready and awaiting her command. I know you thought it would be easy, said Troll. Gina blinked out of her reverie. Troll's face had lost some of the fear she'd seen the day Dauron fell, but there was still a shadow over him, over them both. Up here, it was easy to forget the darkness plotting at the heart of the world, a darkness that would soon cast its pall over not only Borales, but all of Azeroth if they couldn't defeat it. Easy is not the word I would use, she sighed, but yes, I had hoped for more. She counted ten sunrises since that terrible day, and every night since, Jaina had relived the horror of that moment in her dreams, as the city of light and wonder was plucked from the sky over Khazalgar like a child's toy. But the nightmare had been real, and Jaina knew that it was just the start. Something terrible was coming. Another sundering, another cataclysm, an evil that had a name. Xalatat. Ten days since Jaina and Troll had returned to their respective capitals had been a blur of activity. Courtiers had been dispatched to every corner of Azeroth, carrying with them the full authority of both the Horde and the Alliance within a singular imperative message. A call to unite, a call for the leaders to meet at Boralus, ready to face this new enemy. They would come, Jaina had been sure of it. And some had, but many had not. Perhaps she had been naive in retrospect, not realizing quite how badly the Radiant Song had affected people across the world. Even now, as she looked across her own city, watching the guards on patrol, workers in the docks, innkeepers sweeping their steps, while market traders rolled barrels and loaded carts, she wondered how many of her people had heard the song, unsettled by the vision and the voice. How many were afraid, left wondering what it could mean. There was a metallic clatter from behind them, followed by the muttered curses and sound of heavy footfalls on the spiral stair. Jaina and Thrall watched as Danath Trollbane emerged on top the roof. He paused for breath, chest heaving under his red tabard. By Thordin's blood, he said. For such a seafaring people, the cool tyrants do have a fondness for stairs. Jaina stifled a laugh. She couldn't help it, despite her fall mood. Danath was the first to respond to her call. He had been in the city for several days already helping Jaina prepare for the summit. If he was disappointed by the responses from the other leaders as they trickled in, he had never shown it. Instead, he had been a steadfast companion, an excellent sounding board, and a very good friend. Have they come up with a solution? asked Thrall. Actually, said Danat, I think we have. He turned back to the stairs. Come, there is much to consider. Gina could hear the mumble discussions as she and Thrall followed Danat back into the meeting room, deep at the heart of Proudmore Keep. With the return of the trio, those discussions fell into a respectful silence. The assembled leaders had been locked in conversation all night, trying to overcome both geography and politics to assemble a strike force that Jaina and Troll could take to Khazalgar. And now, as the representatives stood around a huge war table in the center of the chamber, Jaina dared to hope that Danet had spoken the truth, that they could soon take the fight to Zaatath. The leaders who had answered Jaina and Troll's joint call were, Jaina reflected, an unusual mix. On the Horde side there was Agralan, Agra of the Earthen Ring, and Troll's wife mate, Bane Bloodhoof, the Torin High Chieftain, towering over the slim form of Tarisia, first arcanist of the Nightborn, who in turn stood tall over the diminutive Kiro, caravan leader of the Vuldunai Vulpera. On the other side of the table were the representatives of the Alliance, 
Shandis Federmoon, newly risen to leader of the Night Elves, and Magister Umbrick of the Void Elves stood almost back to back, making an impressive, even beautiful pair next to the stout form of Cordan Wildhammer, the dwarf deputized at Falstad's representative from the Council of the Three Hammers. Finally, Tess Greymane represented Guinness, a queen in title and of the group looking perhaps the most battle-ready in her purple and brown leather. It was she who broke the silence, her warm greeting a relief to Jaina who didn't quite know what to expect of the assemblage. When they had left the group, several hours before, tempers had been high, the atmosphere tense as each leader had argued about the respective burdens of office and the limitations displaced on them to contribute to the strike force. Jaina approached the table, covered now by a large map that had not been there earlier. She recognized the region once. The Arati Highlands? Danat opened his mouth to speak, but Umbrik got in first. This is a risk, he said quietly, long blue fingers steeped under his chin. I need something less uncertain. So do we all, said Bane. The Thor folded his massive arms and raised his chin, making Tarisa duck out of the way of his feathered headpiece. But sometimes what we need and what we have are two different things. Agreed, Shandris leaned over the table. We must take the opportunity offered and use it well. Jaina looked around the group. What opportunity? Danath? The Seventh Legion, he pointed to the location of his own kingdom on the map of the Arati Highlands. There's a considerable force massed at Stormguard, a ready-made army awaiting command. Thrall rubbed his chin. Interesting. Who commands this garrison? My niece, Maran, said Danath. As my diplomatic duties draw me to Stormwind, she stands as regent of Stormguard. I have had word she had been reinforcing her position with the Seventh Legion Auxiliary. He spread his hands. Her own decision, but I trust she is... Stoking tensions with the Magar. Agra stepped forward, shaking her head. The Horde granted the base at Hammerfall to the refugee orcs amidst the armistice. After the Fourth War, Overlord Greyrach and her people had nowhere to go. The land surrounding Hammerfall are much like Nagrand, a gentle place for their people to make a fresh start on Azeroth. She pointed to the other side of the map where the orc stronghold lay nestled under the hills and turned to Thrall. But the wounds of her Draenor have not fully healed, for Gerach or her people. The Korkron now trained in number there at her request to deter action from Stormguard. She looked at Danath, a hard expression on her face. What Stormgrad does, Hammerfall answers. Kordan swore under his breath. An old fight, one we thought long settled, he said, running thick fingers through his beard. The situation in the Highlands is no good, no good at all. Jaina watched as Tess and Umbrick exchanged a glance, and Tarisa bent down to listen to something Kiro muttered into her ear. Then Jaina looked at Thrall, but the former war chief was silent, his brow once again furrowed. He was studying the map, not the people around it. Danat raised his hands. Please, we have been through this. He sighed and began a slow circuit of the table. I understand your fears, but you forget Stormgrade still struggles to recover from the Fourth War. Maran requested aid from the Seventh Legion to help farmers fend off predators, to train new soldiers to support the Alliance, to maintain our family's rule while I am absent. I trust she is only doing what she feels she must as a leader and that the matter will easily be righted. A fresh murmur spread around the table, but Danath would not be deterred. Here is our strike force, the Seventh Legion, and, he nodded as he walked by Agra, the Corcoran. Two of the best fighting forces in Azeroth, trained, ready. We could not hope for a better army. He stopped, and now stood by Jaina and Thrall once more. He looked at the two of them. Maran will listen to you, Jaina. I have heard how well she regards you and your mother. I will write to her as well to tell her of your coming and prepare the Seventh Legion to march. And while I don't know Gera, I know you, Thrall. The Horde may not have a war chief, but the Corcoran are yours to command. Thrawn held Danat's gaze for several moments, then nodded. His eyes found Jaina's. Perhaps this is our best option, for both rallying a strike force and avoiding a larger conflict. Jaina considered. The situation in the Arati sounded delicate, to put it mildly, but Danat was right. They needed an army, and here was not one, but two, waiting for a proper target. Gina reached for her staff. Then so it will be. I will order the fleet to sail for Stormgrad. By the time they arrive, the strike force will be ready. Thrall, 
You will go to Hammerfall and negotiate with Gera for the Corcoran. I will come, Agra said. She stepped around the table to join Thrall. Gera is a sister to me. She laid a hand on her mate's shoulder. I promise she will listen. Agreed. Danat, I will go to Stormgrad. I am sorry, Lord Admiral, said Danat, bowing his head in apology. I have been away from Stormwind too long already. Turalyon has sent word that I am urgently needed to rejoin his court. But on my honor, Maran will gladly receive you and your word on this matter. He smiled. Very well, said Jaina. She turned to the assembled leaders. I thank you all for your courage and candor on this council. We are adjourned. As the leaders began filling out, offering their farewells, Jaina turned to Thrall and Agra. Prepare yourselves, she said, conjuring a portal. We leave at once. Jaina, Thrall, and Agra had barely stepped through the portal from Boralus to the Arati Highlands when they sensed the situation had taken a drastic turn. They had arrived in a hollow, shielded from view by steps hillsides. No sooner had they got their bearings than Agra rushed forward, cursing under her breath. Jaina watched as she crouched by a body, laying face down. It was not the only one. Trov stepped over a human corpse, the man's armor split by axe blows. Oh no, Jaina whispered. She counted the bodies, twelve in total, six humans in the colors of the Seventh Legion, six of the orcs in furs and letters of the Corcron. Casting a wary eye over the surrounding hilltops, she joined the other two. What happened? Agra pulled a bloodied Seventh Legion sword from the nearest Corcron. A fight to the death, she said. She stood and used the sword to indicate several orc arrows struck in the weak points of their armor. The human staged an ambush. Thrall picked up his life mate's strain of thought, only to find the Corcron a formidable foe. He looked down at the bloody scene, his expression grim. A battle of mutual annihilation. Two small forces equally matched in number, perhaps equally and foolishly, surprised at the strength of their enemy. He looked at Jaina. I fear we may be too late. We cannot be too late, said Agra. She dropped the sword and turned to her companions. But I agree that time is short. I will go directly to Hammerfall and stay Gera's hand. You both should continue to Stormgrad. A united front may be the fastest route to peace. Why the fuck are you sending Thrall there? Never mind. Thrall nodded. Luck, my love, he said. The two clasped hands. Then, without another word, Agra took off, sprinting to the northern hillside which she deftly scaled before disappearing from view. Thrall washed her go, then turned to Jaina, to Stormguard then. But as they left their cover, Jaina heard a high whistling sound. Almost before she registered it, Thrall jerked where he stood and took a stumbling step backwards to the feathered shaft of a projectile emerging between his shoulder and the chest armor. Jaina spun, instinctively putting herself between Thrall and the archer. She raised her staff high and cast a protective shield for cover. Another whistle, but this time the arrow glanced off the shield. That moment was all Gina needed to spot her target. There, by the solitary tree at the top of the hill opposite, came a flash of movement. A cloaked figure broke cover, bow rays quiver bouncing on their backs as they fled. At once, Jaina balled her fist and threw it forward, sending an orb of crackling purple energy flying towards the hillside. A moment later, the tree exploded in a gout of yellow flame and pink light. But of the bowman, there was no sight. Cursing, she knelt beside Thrall. Leave it. I will be fine, said Thrall, weaving her away. He grabbed the shaft of the arrow still protruding from his flesh and pulled it free in a single tug. I don't think you should do that. He held up the arrow to examine it. I hope, anyway. Jaina peered at the arrowhead. It was smeared with blood, the liquid near black, but there was something else, too. Another substance. Bright blue, oily. Her eyes widened in horror. Poison. Thrall, you. Thrall tossed the arrow to one side, then gave his injured shoulder an experimental roll. He winched. The wound was still seeping. I'll be fine, he said, then paused. But we do need to get to Stormgrad and quickly. He gestured to the hillside. Lead the way.